here. I have Paul Els Nelson right here. <laughs> Second. Ironically, we met on an airplane a long time. Yeah, we did. And, 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 and when we landed, the lady behind us said that should have been a podcast. Do you remember that? That's right. That's the last thing she said. She goes, I want your, I want your, your cards because that should have been a podcast. <laughs> She's like, just listening to you guys. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. That was awesome. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good. Yeah. Like I, in-flight, conference, in-flight entertainment. That's right. You were flying to a uh, funeral and I was flying to... Alabama. A job or something, right? We went to Alabama. That's right. After that, Alabama. Yeah. Oh, my God. My uncle had just passed away. Wow. That was the first time in America that I had rented a car I mean, like as an adult on my own. Mm-hmm. Rented my own car and done something like as a single adult. Wow. It's a big adulting thing for me. <laughs> and it really opened up the world to me after that because then I could rent cars in other places. Again. Yeah, and it's, it's odd because when you're renting a car, they have all these... Uh, tricks uh, and concerns and they put that fear factor are you sure oh, oh yeah it's yeah. only 20 but after, you, after you get past that then you know it kind of opens up the world because it does you know lyft and and uber are these new conveniences but they're expensive they are i mean if you think about renting a car and being able to drive anywhere yeah so um uh yeah it was uh, i actually bought a tiny car because of that i oh, bought really a very small because i was like i rent these things and i love them right might as well have one Right, I understand. That. Interesting. So you drove uh, miles from the airport. <laughs> Which I like the story. This is a good story. Okay. So I, I'm going to, to um, from Heflin. Did we land? Did we live in Heflin? I think we did, didn't we? Yes. Uh-huh. So we landed this or Birmingham. Birmingham. That's what it was. I was going to Heflin. We landed in Birmingham. Right. Heflin is the town where my uncle was the mayor. Okay. So um, I, I get my. This is my first car. I get this little red car. I don't even know what it is. And, and it, it has this like sabotage, forget the gas tap. It would never open. Huh. You can never put gas in it. But um, anyway, I get everything loaded in it and I get, you know, um, this weird GPS that's really strange. I hadn't seen it like before. It's like heavy on, it had to be positioned on the dashboard and like oh, the sandbags. Yeah. Really odd. Hmm. But anyway, so I'm, getting, so I'm getting used to that, you know, and, and kind of like my bearings about where I'm going because it's kind of like with and without the phone and stuff. And so I'm going like Dallas speed <laughs> toward Heflin and I get pulled over. Oh my. Yeah. And, and, um, so, uh, uh, the guy was really polite to me and that's when I had my platinum hair and my magenta sunglasses. <laughs> and so I was quite a sight, I'm sure. And, um, he, uh, he talked to me and he noticed my Superman charm. I have a Superman charm. And, um, throughout the conversation, he, I said, you know, my uncle just passed away and he was the mayor of, of Heflin. I'm like trying to play that card, you know? And he's like, well, let me see. And, and he Googles the whole thing. Like, he, he's like, well, Robert Rigsby just met, and he was the mayor of Heflin. Well, welcome to Alabama. And he's, <laughs> and, and I get off. Like he, he, I wasn't in any trouble. He was like, just, he said, you know what? In Alabama, we have these things. They're posted about every 10 miles. And, they, and they're, they, they tell you like the number of miles per hour that you should be driving. <laughs> of course. And I was like, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And um, he actually had me get out of the car and sit in his car, which was awkward to me. I didn't, I wasn't used to that, you know, because normally in Dallas, like you stay in the car yeah. and they come and talk to you. This guy had me get out of the car, come around the back and sit in his car with him. Whoa. So that was kind of scary because I thought he was going to just haul me off. Yeah, you know? no kidding. You know, and he runs all my stuff and he says, all your stuff checks out. You know, you're not like, and, and you don't have any drugs and there's nothing in the trunk. And I was like. Yeah. It's pretty funny though, but and so so my so the my moral and my my punchline is when I would tell the story at, at like the dinner at, after the funeral mm-hmm. was that I was a good old boy for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because I got to say, you know, it's my uncle. My uncle actually was that's the right that town. So you better be good to me. Because, you know, yeah. Good old no yeah, American no you. Funny. That's crazy, man. Yeah. So it worked out. It worked out. But it, was, it makes good for good story. Yeah. And and the primarily the thing I think that caught us, you know, when you're on an airplane, it's <sighs> it's hit or miss when you actually find somebody you want to talk to. Right. And then when you find something that's like, whoa, wait a minute, we've got a connection. Yeah, here. we completely lined up. It was yeah. alignment. It yeah. was a big deal. It yeah. was like, uh, and it was completely off topic of where we were going. It was bubbling at the surface. Yeah. Like I really wanted to talk about this, uh, and you had a completely different approach than what I was learning, uh, but it's still followed within the matrix because it's, um, you know, it's, it's right. The, because I'm about three dimensional mapping yeah, and, and, and the, the cube and, and, and envisioning space in three dimensions and, and the dynamics of that. And, and, um, 
and all of that and all of those implications. And and I think about it in terms of like kind of like a metacognitive tool that you can use to translate uh-huh. between things. I, I talked about it with my friend James just the other day. And, um, you know, I was saying, you know, one thing, one thing in my, in my paper that was so exciting is that Manhattan really fits that you know, as a, kind of like a context. Because when you look at it from like a drone point of view, it's just a grid. It's very grid. It's just a grid, you yeah. know? So it's like a big game board, you know? And it makes the Matrix movie work really well to have that as like, kind of like the context. Because the, everything, all the buildings and all the stuff happen in that kind of environment, you know? Yeah. So it, it, it makes for a good kind of like a landscape for um, a plot to develop. And, and um, that's what I was explaining to him. I said, so you can think, and I said, for me, there's an alignment between that and cartography and particularly Japanese, because that's my love is Japanese mm-hmm. and Chinese too, but obviously Japanese is my real love. And, um, and I said, so well, it's really, he said, so James was responding and he said, you know, so that alignment, you're talking about that grid alignment between like the language and then the, the, the map and then the, like the three dimensional architecture, you know, all of that alignment, it's really logical. It seems to fit together really tight. I said, yeah, but I said, what you can't ignore and what makes it really sexy is, um, that seemingly random component, you know, whether you can capture calligraphy or choreography or um, what was the other word? I had another word. It was calligraphy, choreography, and um, calligraphy. So it was like the three, like three um, different ways to capture motion on a grid. Right. You know, and and, and you can th- you can really see that in Audacity. You can see the sound wave and then and the grid and and how to cut it up and you know meander around and kind of compose on a grid. It's and, and one of my professors explained to me that. Um, what we know of as, as like the, the musical staff that came from, um, yes. crusades. Did you know that? So this is a theory and I, it may be like a hearsay story now, like a, like a fable or a wives tale, mm-hmm. but, um, it was that during the crusades, the Catholic priests went out East just to see how their, no, how their Eastern priests were doing, you know, and they, and they went to their cathedrals and they came observing their mass and they were using those strange instruments, you know, that had the really like the long strings and the minor key that would kind of go way you know, into the extremes. And they were like, wait a second, we want our music to just fit right here harmonically. And we want to all match. You know, we don't want you going way up here. We want everybody harmonically staying right, right here. Right. So then that's why they devised the five lines and four spaces that we know of as, as the musical staff. But what we didn't know, what they didn't know of then and what they thought they were doing was making this, these bars for a cage. But what they really did was kind of like open up a whole another realm of thinking. Yeah, no kidding. You know, that, that feeds right into that thing like audacity and computer. Yes. Like a whole bunch of thinking. Have you seen that? Um, I remember I passed you that link. It was called uh, Music DNA. Yes. Where it actually had the spiraling it's DNA. Beautiful. It's beautiful stuff. Yeah. It, I, I love that. I, was, I love um, visualizing sound. Yeah. That, that's one of my things I want to do after we finish the film uh-huh. is to do a, 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 an opera on stage. Yes. And I want to have um, kind of a grid, like cubic components mm-hmm. and have sound actually move from space to space. Yeah. And then I, I've had this old invention and I'll just share it with you. Mm-hmm. It was called a light mic. So like as your voice gets louder, the light gets brighter or vice versa. So then what was it? What I was going to do was like have a person singing and, the, and then someone else would like their, as their voice went down, someone else's voice would get louder in another space. And then the lights would do the same thing. So that like you're see, you're visually seeing the sound move across the stage. Wow. Yeah. So that you're kind of melding that idea of choreography and sculpture. Huh. Heck so, yeah. No, no. Uh, I was always, I didn't know why they, I mean, like I would, I was always wondering that they would have integration with audio cued lights you know something yeah. that was I mean, even just writing on the spectrum but it seemed as a lot of these guys are just doing it by hand you know and right. they try to stay in time like another instrument but that would be great if the music was more influential right. one know. of my one of my early ideas was to have a microphone that would have a light in it like a flame so that it wasn't an actual flame but as your voice as if you're like a poet uh-huh. as you're speaking and you got loud it, your face would get really bright 
Oh, and then, and then when you got quiet, it would get Whoa. dimmer. Oh, you know, so it would be it would be like you're talking into a torch. You know? Yes, yeah. You know, so but it, it's, it's, it's called a light mic. It's, oh. a, it's like a Laurie. That's kind of a real Laurie Anderson. Dude, animation. that's still that can that's still, one of her style. Really, so, yeah. oh, that's still uh, prominent. Did she ever do it on stage or anything? Like I don't that? know. If she did, she did one thing. She did was she had her hands light up, and they were attached to drums, and her hands and feet would light up, and, they, and she could like, and it was like. It was a sonic and, and electric yeah. thing together. Still that mic thing. Yeah. That's still Isn't that fun? That would still fun. work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. Lighting up your face. It kind of got, it kind of got hit. Like it was the thing that I shared with, amongst the um, art technology people uh -huh. then, but didn't really take off. They didn't, I mean, well, ironically, uh, there was, uh, so when I was d doing uh, camera commercials, uh -huh. everybody wanted to see what was in the frame. So they'd have all these monitors everywhere. Oh. So people could see what the camera was looking at, what angle it was looking at. And, oh. and people were looking at lighting. People were looking at uh, the director wanted to see composure and, oh. and they wanted to see the art director wanted to know if the clock that he put on the wall was, was working in the shot, things like that. Well, Cameron, uh, and his brother came up with this and the patent just, ex it just ended. But oh. I had always had the concept of having the, you know, um, when I'm outside and filming uh -huh. and you've done it with the phone, it's very hard to see the screen. Yeah. So this concept was, it was an eye, it was your regular, you know, you put your camera, you put your eye on the cameras, you can see through the lens. Uh -huh. Well, this would be very, I mean, cause when you do that, you're closing up all the light. Right. You can see the screen very clear. Yeah. You can see a very large screen in front mm -hmm. of you. So what he, his plan was is to have these little helmet, like cyborg type of thing for all the crew members. Wow. So they all saw the shot at the same time. Oh. I was very enlightened when I saw the patent. I was like, heck yeah. And I'm like, why is it still to this day? Why isn't this a yeah. possibility? And uh, ironically, eyepieces are just as fancy as cars. Right. You can get a cheap Chinese one, which for like a hundred bucks, or you can get the legit 4k, whatever the heck. And it's like $3,000 eyepiece just to see eye visuals so i was like man this is a very odd market but still what a great idea yeah. to have all the uh that way everybody's in sync everybody's, everybody's in sync. sync everybody sees what the shot's going yeah. on the boom guy for crying out you still have this eye that you're looking at the room in because that's what we do as, as videographers you look at what the next shot you're looking for the next shot and then you pop that camera over there the sound guy could see if his boom mic was in the shot and things like right, that right. but uh, right. i guess it's one of those technologies that doesn't catch on unless people use it or it becomes a fad or or something like that but i think that light that you like should, light mic i think i think you could easily get a, an arduino and some kid with some leds and a 3d printable you know what that's really funny because i was on a i was on a train uh -huh. to new york one time and we stopped in in um philadelphia to, to read re new engines uh -huh. they, they flip around and it was so wild. So all the lights on the train went out and these kids came out of their seats and were facing us. And they had these like toy Star Trek phasers and they did the same thing. They lit up their faces and they started singing Kokomo. No way. Yes. It was hilarious. That's so funny that you mentioned that. All right. Yeah. Cause the kids were, they would, kids would like keep that up. Wouldn't they? Yeah. Like a karaoke device. Mm -hmm. They would love that. It, it would be really easy to do. Oh yeah. I think if anything, you could probably do a, it's like a toy, a thingy verse. Yeah. So something that's very interesting. I've, I've, looked on Thingiverse and said, you know what? I'm going to go to my local library, which has 3D printers Oh, now. so there's such a thing as Thingiverse? So it, it like, it tells you about all the ideas that are out there? Yeah. All, well, uh, it's all the ideas that people have drawn. Oh, drawn. drawn. So say for instance, uh, a door handle from the 1950s that's oh. not around anymore. Somebody went in there and rebuilt it so you can print it out. And if you had that 50 model toaster or whatever, you can pop Crazy. that handle that's on. Wild. So uh, there's like book markers, there's like uh, glasses. Oh, that's fine. And you, if you have your own printer or no, like libraries have the printing, wow. you just take the file down there and say, can you print this out? So what I'm saying is a lot of the systems were like, oh yeah, you can build it this way. Go get an Arduino, go get this 3D printed and then put this in this slot and this wow. program and this program. But people will still be like, can I just get the unit? Yeah. So that's, I think with that mic, you could easily do that. You can say, hey, here's the components and this is how you build it. And, and probably make money off the, the uh, video right. that's showing how to do it. And then actually have units that you can like for the extra costs, yeah. just start putting on it. Cause I think that, man, it sounds very simplistic audio yeah. and, and maybe it's, you know, you, you could just make it where it's built onto a mic or yeah. a handheld mic. That's, that's my idea. Yeah. I, I know that my, that would be a fun gadget. My, um, uh, my daughter, but can you imagine like a choir, you know, Oh, a whole oh my gosh. Face? well, not to mention you know, pitch, you know, or it, they different, they know, turn different wow. colors. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be great? The altos you and know. the bases. Yeah. Man. Think about, I think how you could use that like in an opera. Yes. You know, wouldn't that be great? You know, a lot of these DJs 
I didn't know why they wouldn't put display the waveform. Have you ever seen um, most of these guys will take composers and the, you could actually see blocks on yes, the keyboard? Yes, like that, yeah. Why can't they do that with some of the concerts? I think that would be, well, I guess Guitar Hero is a good example of that. Right. More of a Guitar Hero style, style concert where we all know right. when the, the drop's about to hit. Philip Glass kind of did that for a while. Yeah. He was doing similar things. Like you would go to his concert, well, you know, his concerts, some of them were like, hours and hours long wow. and they're so they're they're kind of meditative because a lot of it is the same kind of component over and over and over and then it slowly changes that was his early work you okay know? Huh. but he's he's really all over the place but um no but he would have these big screen like a big screen and and my friend would say so you'll be at the philip glass concert and maybe like the next 20 minutes until you realize that that screen that was yellow is now like blue or or something had changed but you were so mesmerized and in the moment with the music and the visuals that you didn't really notice the change wow you know wow yeah you know um brent and i did a, a film together about um these um compact uh who's this who's this Brent, my partner the, oh okay the, the, we were together you know yeah not anymore. but um there was this um my friend Kim Baker from high school designed this shopping bag that condensed into a little, like a little envelope, like yeah. envelope and it's called the green shopper. And, um, she wanted us to make a really kind of funny documentary and go out and talk to people and do those funny things. But instead we, we made what we, what we really made was like this kind of like how to like, First, you like you have me like putting things in the garbage in the recycling bin <laughs> from the from the bag. And uh -huh. You see me like pushing it together, and then and then I go shopping in the dollar store, and and just like he, and he's using the camera like this, like he's wearing one of those cameras, right? And he's just kind of like walking around, like filming all the stuff. And it was really interesting because what I noticed was the cashier all of a sudden knew he was being filmed, and he was okay with it. But he changed, he was performing because he would like, he would, it, it, instead of just like, kind of this like boring nonchalant, I'm gonna scan these scans, suddenly it was like, I'm scanning the scan and I'm making these little gestures at the end uh, as I'm scanning. Like, no. Yeah, it was really kind of cute. Yeah, it was funny. I'm like, because he would do it like this, like this magic. <laughs> like, as he was scanning, it was really, it was neat. Interesting. And then, and, um, and then, and I did all the sound. I, I loved it. I had a really good time with um, the keyboard and sound. Cause I, I have this, I have this, this fun way of making music is where I make the music really fast, then I'll slow it way down. Or oh, yeah. I'll speed it way up, or, or, or and play those against each other. You know. Uh -huh. So are you using primarily a keyboard? Or? Yeah, I mean, it was a keyboard thing. It was like I think it was a Yamaha at the time. Wow. But yeah, I, and I had like hours and hours, all different things that I had done, and and this one, um, it's you know, it's still on my YouTube channel. Um, it's got funny little little um, components of, of of musical constructions that will show up, and all of a sudden you hear this like really like grandiose piano thing that's really furious, and it just kind of like appears during this moment, and then it kind of decays, and then and then we're back to this little kind of like harpsichord thing that it's like okay he's doing his daily thing like maybe he's doing his laundry or he's driving home or you know and, and it, it's a recurring theme, but it's only like a five minute film. Weird. Yeah, but the music. But I was really proud of the music. Interesting. Yeah, and we really went over the top. We did <laughs> too much for what we were expo what we were supposed to do, uh -huh. which was like a YouTube kind of like on the street. You know, would you would, would a man carry a bag? Kind of make a yeah. joke thing. We ended up really making a move. Where movie. where is this? It's work? on it's on YouTube on my my channel, Paul Snellson. Yeah. Yeah, and you can and watch this short film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And there's some other things too that are there too. Very cool. So uh, the newest project is the what was it oh, called? The or, or our thing that we're doing. Yeah. Oh yeah. The um, well the the name of the paper was um, the cybernetic art matrix mm -hmm. and the story of the grid. Yes. But for when it got published, they dropped out the and. So it's just cybernetic art matrix, the story of the grid, like no punctuation. But um, interesting thing about that is that that title came from Roy Ascot who is an amazing scholar. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, in academia, you have to have a touchstone. You can't just say, this is my idea. You have to say, I think yeah, I'm going back to this idea. You have to have a touchstone. A touchstone. You can't, you can't just say, this is my idea. Right. You know, so I did, I did this kind of like, I don't know. It's like a seek, it's like seeking, it's basically seeking. Mm -hmm. And I, I stumbled on to Roy Ascot and I started reading about him and that cybernetic art matrix thing totally aligned with what I thought of when I got really, really involved with Monrian. Okay. And, um, I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense. But anyway, what Roy Ascot did was he basically, in his mind, invented the internet in the 60s. Like, he invented what we know of now as the internet. And he called it this telematic embrace. 
that was in the like, and he, and he knew about um, early GPS and what he called telematic te technology. Uh -huh. So it was like, it was like cell phone technology, but it had Texas Instruments a long time ago. And he was seeing the future. He, he could see the future because he had these components that he was playing with and he was making cybernetic art early that was interactive and systemic. And, and he would do, and he had like puzzle art and movie, moving panels art, you know, thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that were kind of, were they sculpture? Were they painting? Were they drawing? You know, they were kind of like in between because they had moving components and, and visual components that, and it, and it was interactive. You, you, you know, the, the viewer was part of the piece. Oh, okay. You know, so, and that was really groundbreaking at the time. But his idea of the cybernetic art matrix was completely like gelled uh, my thing hmm. that I thought of with Mondrian, you know, way back when I was in high school, I had been studying Mondrian in the Bauhaus and, and I was at a lake and I looked at the, and the landscape like this and the trees like this and, and suddenly it was like oh and the windows are, and, and then everything just sort of like fit in a different way oh interesting yeah and 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 it was years and then and i had already been studying japanese at that time okay and um anyway so i found this ray ascot guy well anyway so for, fast forward to the end of the paper after we published it and i published it again on academia.edu roy ascot himself endorsed it wow so that's kind of a win yeah you but know. primarily the you, we came up with the name cams oh yeah that's right the cam era era yeah and they like that the, the, and the, the cybernetic guys that yes that wrote that published the paper and the people that i worked with they really liked that okay good yeah and they got it and they, and because we wrote that into the description yeah you know the i kind of call it a libretto right but we wrote that in and um the girl from Buenos Aires that helped me edit that stuff. She totally got it. And she made the words just sing because she understood she's a similar kind of thing, but she's doing kind of educational graphics. Hmm. So it's kind of like um, graphics plus text to get the most punch, yeah. you know, and, and using the visual and the, the linguistic as, as interchangeable languages, you uh -huh. know? So like, I mean, just the simple idea of like bold type and like how to make bold type really work, you know, but also with that and, and, and like a pamphlet, for example, hmm. or a PowerPoint, you know, all of those com visual components and color, you know, different ways to make text really kind of more memorable okay. and make your point as, a, as an education device. Right, right. So, um, you know, she's completely on board. What was really funny was when it, she's a PhD candidate with Roy Ascott himself as well. And she's studying, she's working in... Um, SUNY purchased in New York, which is kind of like upstate New York. Yeah. And then he's in um, uh, Glasgow and Shanghai concurrently. He's going back and forth. I see. Yeah. And so she's working with him like through Facebook and then online and stuff. But when you look at her website, it's all this. It's like every component Whoa. is, it's like every little thing is a little cell. And it's like, I was like, oh, and, and yeah, that was kind of neat to meet her. And she really, we worked really well together. Cause she ended up um, being the head of the visual when it, cause you know, cause the next magazine quarter, I was the, I'm the visual artist and I got to be the cover. What, what magazine is it? It's the same one. Um, the cybernetics journal of human knowing. Gotcha. And, and that was actually founded by Roy Ascot himself. No kidding. And he created the logo. So that logo that shows up in the PDF, right. that's Roy Ascot. Right. And, and for those who are like listening, not knowing what we're talking about it, like this, this is the, uh, uh, an art matrix where, uh, essentially it's kind of a spur, like a touchstone of, uh, Roy Ascot and, uh, Andy Warhol. Yeah, right. We and use it, those guys. Yeah. Right. And it's basically showing the world as we see it in three dimensions. And, and that's the biggest thing that happened to us when we were on that on that flight was that I was coming up with a camera system and being immersed in this 360 world where we have to freaking translate it into data. And yet that's what we do all the time. We're, we're in this physical 3d realm and it's right. And so many people are blind to it, right? They're, they can't, they don't really even, and now with GPS, they're even more blind to it. Oh my gosh. So they, they just have a robot telling them where to turn. Yes. So they can't really think this way anymore. No. And, uh, no. uh it is, it, and, and thank goodness we are seeing, um, our realms in different aspects. I mean, even time, yeah, for example, yeah, exactly. even our uh, knowing the quantum uh, parallel dimensions, you know, like just knowing that that is a theory and it, and uh, how that can actually be closing at every instance that we're on there. And, and remember earlier we were talking about the the. Um 
Catholic priests and 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 the the staff, the musical staff. Yeah. That's an early way to map to map time. Now tell tell me a little bit more about the staff. The, so, so remember we had like, oh we talked about know, the, the grid. crusades and, and yep. we had those the the Asian instruments that were the long strings mm -hmm. that were minor keys and they wanted all this harmonics with the five lines right. and four spaces in the notes. You know, so that's an early way to map and, and foresee time. Yeah. And and it's interesting is uh, where are you on the edge? Where are, where's the edge of your uh, knowledge now? Because you have had these great life changes. You're, you're uh, getting older, yeah. you know, in, in our time period where, yeah. and uh, you know, just telling my kids about calendars and, and how uh, the Hebrew calendar and or the Masonic calendar, You're like whoa, these got some uh, cultures the, here. And the Muslim calendar, yeah, Muslim calendar, uh, Mayan and solstice. It's just what yeah. we're spinning, where, how, yeah. And uh, and it's very interesting the uprising of all the uh, flat earthers as well. Yeah. And and it's just kind of like, hey, question this is what I hear. It's like, wow, you know what? We're not going to take this knowledge that you've been feeding us. We got to figure it out on our own. And and some of them just yeah, I feel flat I feel earth. like some of my stuff like. That I that I came up with early on, I, don't, I think it was dangerous knowledge. I don't think they wanted people to be able to think in the three dimensions. Oh yeah, you know, I think they could see like too much that that being able to construct might be a danger thing. Yeah, that, I can see that. Yeah, it was funny. But what's what's well, the well, edge? But back to the calendar. Okay. I mean, pers personally, that's a big deal for me. Uh -huh. Because I've lived with three different calendars, and I don't think many people in America have done that. But you, you know, do, you actually... I've lived with three different calendars. Let me explain. How do you... This is really, really wild. Okay, but it was just—it just happened to me. This is my life. So you know, I grew up in America. So we have like Sunday and Saturday and Sunday are the weekends. You know, and Sunday is the, is the first day of the weekend. But then we all look forward to Friday, and then we have Saturday and Sunday. You know, that's what you're used to, right? Right. Okay. Now wait, this can get better. So then I moved to Saudi Arabia. And the weekends are Thursday and Friday. Oh, so then Wednesday is like Friday. See? And then Saturday is like Monday now. And so it changes your whole life. Sunday is Tuesday. You know, so it was like a whole, I lived that way all through elementary school. No. Yeah. It's, and and I, in my mind, I'm constantly like, okay, so today's Saturday. We have to go to school. It's the first day of the week, you know, because we just had... Friday yesterday, which was like our Sunday. Yeah. You know, it's like, so you know, you don't, you just so I, li I lived that. I what lived that. To, but there's more. The because that's the, that's the Muslim way. that Their calendar, like their weekends are Thursday and Friday. But why so it's like, thank God it's Wednesday. Right. We left. Well, we left. We moved out of there. But why not drop drop the American way just for the time being, right? Well, we, but, you know, because your original, your original, that's the, you've assigned meaning to those days. Man. You have so much meaning assigned to those days. Like, it's like, thank God it's Wednesday. <laughs> You know, you're thinking, you're thinking they got to Wednesday because tomorrow behind. it's a whole different way. It's, but it's not really, it's the same days. Yeah. They just have different, it's like the weekends are now okay. Thursday. You know what I mean? It's not, a, it's not a different time zone. It's just a different meaning for the days. Amazing. It's abstract. Huh. But get this, then, then add another caveat to it. So then I go to boarding school at Interlochen and just arbitrarily, Interlochen. Interlochen in Michigan. So arbitrarily, they decided that our weekends are going to be Sunday and Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank God it's Saturday. Tomorrow we have the weekend, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so so then Sunday was the day you go to church, but it was also like the first day of the weekend. So you uh, really didn't want to go to church because you've been up all night Saturday night. Yeah, yeah. You know, watching the movies or dancing with your friends, right. you know? So three different calendars. And I don't think anybody else has lived like that. But you realize how much of your days have an abstract meaning attached to them based on where they fall. So like that fifth day of a five day work week is the Friday, whether it's Wednesday or whether it's Saturday or whether it's Friday, it's like, that's the day just before the weekend that you're like, oh, thank God. you know, and, I, and I've lived through that. And, I, and, I, and I'm just now sharing that, but I don't think many other people have lived like that and, no. and understand. No, I it's, a, it's a translation system, you know, and you learn meaning about it. it's a whole different way of thinking about time. Yeah, because because you because yeah, cause, well, what, and you're always going back to your or because you know your point of origin is like, thank God it's Friday and that can like you know and, and Saturday and sa like yeah, there's meanings to all those days. What religion are you? Oh, what religion am I? Well, I, I um sort of me and uh, Robert Rauschenberg both were, grew up Church of Christ, uh -huh. but Robert Rauschenberg and Robert Robert Rauschenberg I'm stuttering. Robert Rauschenberg, the pop artist, you know, he's like he was friends with um, Andy Warhol and Jasper Johns. Okay, they were like the three guys that came up with that pop art at the same time. Yes. 
So he's from Corpus Christi in Texas. And um, when he moved to New York, he changed his name to that, to that Jewish name. Okay. And, and, um, and, and he joined the Navy. So he had those two like really constrictive things early in his life, like the, the, the um, Church of Christ, which is really constrictive. It's very like, I, I used to say that it was like a bathtub and a microphone, <laughs> you know, because I'm an artist. And so I like the Catholic Church because there's like art, you know, and there's yeah. sound and there's smells, you know, and, and, and I could really sympathize with Warhol because he learned all that stuff by staring at those 2D, you know, Byzantium um, art, like the the screens, you know, that there are these flat portraits in, in his um, church as a child oh. that, that he would, that, that would move, you know, and the, the um, you stare at him long yeah, and, and, you know, I, th I think yeah. he stared at them all, you know, all throughout his childhood, you know, and he was homeschooled, you know, he learned, and his mom was his early art teacher. Uh -huh. And just now at the museum, they're really memorializing her in a respectful way. It's really nice. Like now, like I almost cried this last time because there's a portrait of her where she looks really regal and dignified. Where usually they would show her kind of frumpy and like old school, you yeah. know. But now she's, she's got this like portrait and it's like, it's almost like a passport photo, hmm. but it looks really like she's looking up and she looks really intelligent and, and like, like kind of like she could see the future kind of. Wow. That's amazing. Cool. And so it's really like, it's, it's, it's a really respectful portrait hmm. and it's um it's a photograph that they print on the wall and then they've written up a nice big text on the blurb about her on the wall and how important she was to him wow yeah and she really was important you know because he had seen by the stance he shook a lot yeah as a child and she well is he the only child no he was the youngest of three of three wow and the other two didn't have artists. The, other, the other two were um you know they were like just regular boys. He he was smaller and and he had that kind of albino weird uh -huh. thing with his skin. You could say it was he blotchy. A bit. And, and he had a little bit. Of, there's there are reports that he had some Aspergers. Interesting. Yeah. Still, what a powerful artist and, and didn't come from wealthy background. No, but she. But you know, I just think that she she had this really entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. and she built that in early on. And she would like make. Um, you know, they do, they would do Easter eggs together. That was a big deal in the huh, culture. Really? You know, it was like a lot of drawing goes into this. I mean, they did really amazing Easter eggs. It wasn't just like what we do. <laughs> it was like, they were just gorgeous. And um, so she taught him that early on. And then she also made crepe paper and tin can bouquets and she would sell them from door to door. Yeah. You know, for like a quarter a piece. This wow. is his mother. Wow. She would just cook up this stuff. She's kind of this magic lady. That's probably where he got a lot of inspiration. Well, yeah. Tell me about the, what he did that spurred you for the art matrix. It was like a oh, time capsule. Yeah. That's my favorite thing. Okay. So like at the end, at the end of his kind of, after he huge success, you know, he, he, he he, he develops this kind of vision that's so it's there's like a filter maybe there's a little filter and, and they use a metaphor of the silk screen mm -hmm. you know between like what he observes and then what he turns to art and he keeps like making that boundary like more and more blurry you know mm -hmm. so much so that like his films are like just turn the camera and then, and then it's art because i have it on camera you know so, and whatever happens happens and he used that kind of theory but the time capsules are really important because it was like he was like assembling evidence like look at my magic life like i like look at all this stuff that happened to me like look, here's evidence of like my fan mail here's evidence of like things that i've just collected like all all this stuff is just magic and, I, and I, it's so much that i have to save it all wow and and the best way i can do it is to come up with this modular component system where i put it in a box and i date it and month and day and year and then i tape it up and i send it to a warehouse in a grid in new jersey and it stays you know like king tut's tomb forever and it stays in its little in its little grid place until we open it now in the 21st century and start to assign meaning to all that stuff right and to me it's like oh it's a way of looking at it's a way of thinking about poetry and sculpture at the same time yes so it's like this it's like you can just you, to me a lot of his stuff is like when you read the diary, for example, the diary is, is a similar construction because it has a day and a place, always a day and a place, and then things that happen in between. So the boxes are the same way. So we have like a box and then all the things that were going on at that time go into that box, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a data system. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting because this links up a whole bunch of stuff, right? So you have a grid of three dimensional cubes that have data in each one. And each one has an is an original unit 
there's original things in each one of those components, okay. stuff, right? Uh -huh. Modular components, just like in Chinese, right? So we have each square is in an original concept. We have the same thing with Andy Warhol's time capsules. Each time capsule is unique, but it's a grid and it's a box. Right. So, so, so you can think of that, that abstractly as just a, as a modular component system of, of cubes. Well, coincidentally, Google has adopted a data system of software yeah. that's the same system. It's, it's, a, it's 2D, but it, it's a grid. And then they put their data in each block and they call it Kubernetes, which is the, uh, which is the Greek or origin etymolo etymologically, there's a word, etymologically of the word cybernetics. Wow. So all that comes together. So you see this like grid system mm -hmm. and then you see original thoughts within each square you know, that are contained, but just because I put a square around it, now that's art. Wow. And, and Warhol did that both in two and three dimensions because the time capsules are so powerful because don't forget, it, they're t it's not just garbage. It's not just everything in the office. There's a selection. Like people would say, oh, Andy, put this in the time, this is for the time capsule. It was the thing, wow. everybody knew about it. Hmm. And there was a selection process. And that's what's so precious about them is because going back and looking at them, we can start to see like his whole kind of mythological, the way he thinks about what is art and what is not. And what makes it into the box is really compellingly interesting. Give me an example. Like, I mean, you, you, you might find like airline tickets, you might find a napkin, but that napkin might have someone's autograph on it. Okay. Or, but you know, and one time, one of my friends said they found a whole birthday cake from a party that was at the office. Wow. Yeah, just, you never know. It, and it's the same concept, the way he did his films, where he would just like let things happen and capture them in a, in a um, form. Huh. It, it was, uh, the, and, and the film itself is a rectilinear shape, you know? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's just a framing, it's a framing system. Right. But this, but in this way, it's in both, it's like, it's dynamic. So it's in four, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the third and fourth dimension. Right. So it's, it's, uh, it's the third dimension because it's actual objects. It's the fourth dimension because of time. Time is the fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. I like to think of it that way. It makes it easier. Yep. There are other theories, but I like to just think of the fourth dimension as time. Yes. And I know there's a whole like specious thing about that. Yeah. But it's just easier to think of, of the fourth dimension as time because then that makes everything fit together easier. Yes. Because then that way, that musical staff that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you're just mapping out time on, on that musical staff. Yeah. And in, this, and in a similar way, so do the time capsules like notes on a staff. Yes. Do you see what I mean? Oh yeah. Cause you, you, cause they're on shelves like this, you know, and, and each one is like a note, but, but they're more like, because there's multiple objects in each one. So it's sort of like they're big chords or big fugues, mm. you know, yeah. of, of all these things, all these moments are happening in this one box, you know? So it's, it's like a, it's, it's, it's a, a rhythmic, it's definitely, there's definitely a rhythm to it because there, there's like a, every month he would do the box, you know? Yeah. Or, or there, it, there was like a, it was a temporal aspect to it. Right, right. You know, plus the, plus these are actual objects. Plus that what's so beautiful about it is the selection process. That's what we got to get to see when we go through these. Now he didn't show who, what he put in there. No, so. see, that's what's so beautiful. And then how long were the capsules? Like years or well, after he passed? They're from the seventies. So they're like, they've been there for 50, like. When were they revealed though? Like just, they're just now, they're just now like. I, well, actually, the big archivist, Matt Warbrickon, just passed away. Wow. And he, and he just finished a book just before. I have the, the early copy. I wanted to get him to autograph it, but I didn't know he passed away. Wow. But um, it's called A is for Archive. <laughs> and Andy had that. His, one of his first novels was called A, a Novel. Yeah. Oh, I love, this. I love that. It's great. So he had this guy, um, Undine. And Andine was his taken name. Andine was a character from an opera. And Andine was this really flaming guy, like flaming and, and, and a little bit, a little bit of a caffeine and, and amphetamines at the time. Mm -hmm. But he was in New York and it was high energy and the crazy things were happening. And they didn't really know that these amphetamines were dangerous. Mm -hmm. And then, then that's why at the same, I know I'm getting off topic a little bit, but that's why he made that movie sleep is because at that time wow. that was becoming like obsolete. Nobody was sleeping anymore. You know, wow. so it's like, remember when we used to sleep, like, like, <laughs> it's like, it's like capturing sleep because you know, that was a, a thing yes. that was kind of going away. And, and that was his thing. He would, it, he was kind of doing both. He would, he would capture what's coming new and what's going out. I see. So, so Marilyn, like when he does Marilyn, it was right when she died. Huh. You know, and, and it was like, and, and there was a lot of meaning there. Marilyn uh, Monroe, wow. those portraits. Yeah. But let me get back to Undine and the, and the, uh, the 
the the novel A. Okay. You'll love this. Okay. So all it is is it's him following around Aundine, who is just like observing the world from this flaming point of view, really loud and just grandiose and making all these great and, and cursing and saying all and everything you can think of wow. all these like, all life yeah. for like twenty four hours. Jeez. He tapes it. Then he gives all the tapes to these high school girls and they type it up and that becomes the novel. <laughs> And it's brilliant. It really wow. is. Yeah, it's really brilliant. Yeah, but but it's hard to get through. But it but it captures time in the same way that the can that the huh. films and the time capsules do. Wow. But it's a book. It's it's fun though because it's it because Andine was just like nonstop fire. Yeah. You know, and to capture that, even though those girls really couldn't always hear, and and because they're they're like using headphones and typing and some of them were like oh is it my break you know so they were making typos and they didn't care and andy didn't care about that either he wanted that filter those mistakes to be there yeah and to be part of the process because just the same way that that the maryland silver screens have ink globs on them yeah and and she starts to decay that filtering system is the same way we have the filter of this makes it art now. See, yeah. if it didn't have the typos, like if it didn't have the ink blobs, mm -hmm. it, it would it would be too similar to just like a straight photo or a straight recording. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So that filter of those mistakes make it have a little, it's just like when he offsets a print just a little bit so that it's original. Uh -huh. Like that little mistake is what makes it unique. Wow. Right? And he knew that. That's incredible. It's yeah. really fun. It's just fun stuff. So now that I mean, like you've kind of established that art matrix, what happens now with your journey? Like, have you gotten to the edge where you're like, oh, okay, so uh, I can see different parallel pathways of going or making a choice a certain, a certain way or your own reflection of oh, my own personal thing. You know, um, recently I, I, I did, a, I finally realized one, a thing that I had been thinking about for a long time. So I found a box. It was a simple box. It's like a, it's like a like a curio box. It's, it's a simple like what, like clear plastic plexiglass. Yeah, and it's just cubes. You know, it's just like maybe like three by three or four by four. I don't know, but it's like you put you put objects in it, right? Well, I made these little gestures in aluminum foil. Big deal, right? Little gestures, you know, and they're kind of like popcorn, but it's not but simple. And then I gessoed them, and then I after I like tight like made them really good and tight with the armature. I, I just gessoed them, which is the same way that you would, a quick way to do it with, would be in the sculptor's world with, would be with plaster. Uh -huh. And so I, that was my goal is to eventually go back with plaster and then to go with the Dremel tool, you know, and make them all. So there, each one is a little kind of, it's, it, it's like organic, but it fits exactly in that cube. Huh. So when you look at them, you think, oh, what's like this archeological thing? What is this? Yeah. And, and you see, when you look at them, you can see like in three dimensions, that thing I was talking about, where I'm talking about calli calligraphy, choreography, and melody, all captured. Okay. But it's but these are sculptures, and, wow. and they fit. It's it's the same idea, and I did it in a little bitty box about this big. Wow. Yeah, and that was a real win for me. Uh -huh. That was that was one of, my, one of my recent kind of like a win. That because uh, for me it's when a win for me is when you have an idea, and you can see it so clearly, and then you translate it, and it pretty much. Yes. Equates. Right. Maybe not exactly. Because you, you want, you, just like I was saying about the ink bobs uh -huh. and the typos, you want some of those materials to affect your your end product. You, you want that. But at the same time, you want a clear, you know, communication of your idea too. Yes, yes. So you're always dancing between the two things. Huh. So there's that thing. That, and, you know, I still, you know, and, and I like that it's, it's a manageable scale. I like that uh -huh. because it makes them easy. I think you play with them like a toy, but then also you could say, you know, put them in a model and say, I don't want this like six feet tall or I want this like eight feet, like, yeah. like as big as a building, you know, and, and realize it's aluminum or make it bronze, <laughs> you know, because now with that technology and scanners, we can do that. Yeah. You know, we that's can print right. them. We can even print them in three, in three dimensions. Yeah. You know, so that's exciting to me. Well, the, the other thing is, um, if you look on my website and also on the, the what I call the libretto in um, the Cybernetic Journal of Human Knowing. Uh huh. We talk about my opera. Okay, yeah. Tell and me how that works. That's the second part. That's yeah. the, after we finish this film. That's the second part, and um, so that for me um, is really important because for me, I had this idea for this opera in 1988, 89, 88, 89, and we had a. It was. I love the story. So we had this class at Carnegie Mellon. I was a freshman. Okay. And we were 
evolving. So we were evolving. So we had at first the freshman design majors and the freshman art majors were all lumped together. Hmm. And we had this class called Synthesis. And we were supposed to, it was really a really difficult project. Yeah. We were supposed to um, come up with this um, form that would help kind of like articulate the theme of a consortium or a big um, conference where creatives from all over the world would come together and have this thing and what would they do and what would unite them. Well, for me, it was the Matrix. I was like, I mean, that's, that, that's really the thing. And it was like this epiphany. Huh. Like, it was like, that's the thing. Like, that's the thing that, that unites all these creative thinkers. Is, you know, they all think. Yeah. They all have to deal with the square. They all have to deal with, like, space. They all have to deal with grids. You know, they, and, and, like, musicians and sculptors and everybody all have to deal with this, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, but then I had a lot of, what I was trying to do was kind of sell it. You know, so, um, you know that sequence, everybody knows this now, so I can talk about it. So everybody, that sequence at the beginning of the Big Bang Theory where they talk about history. Yeah. And all of those things happen. Uh -huh. you know, so I was trying to articulate that to you, when, and you've done some of those sketches, mm -hmm. you know, where we have like an aerial view of a cathedral, and then we have a computer chip. Yes. And we have like, you know, a chessboard, you know, all of these things that are on a calendar. Calendar, really important one. Yes. You know, and, and the musical staff, all of the, and like Parcheesi maybe, or um, Backgammon, or um, the other one, like an Abacus, or Connect Four, like all of those things that, that you just you start to see, oh my God, this alignment. Yeah. And it all looks so similar, but they're all so different, and there's so many uses for it. Yes. You know, and what my goal was to make a film that was like a stop motion, so many examples that you're just like, oh my God, I never realized how many things all fit that shape that yes. are everywhere. You know, and, and that was when I was early, that, that's when I was early perceiving it, you know. Yeah. And, I, and just starting to write it down. And it sound, it, it feels like this era, if, if, you, if you're looking back at movies and everything, that it's not so much like, it started to being the giants, you know, like movies in general. Uh -huh. Big, like what is, uh, um, you know, av Avengers, you know, like uh -huh. they have the larger than life person. Right. And then Godzilla, you right. know, a good example. Yeah. Well, now it's starting to be drones or accumulations of molecules or, uh, it, what was it, that one Indian film where the, the robot android makes so many parts of himself he turns into a giant snake right. full of his personal yeah, android there was, an, there was another instance so we, we, were, we, were, we were at a film with my friends from work uh -huh. it was an outing and it was um, Mission Impossible and the, the hero is running and they're looking at, at this map and he's running and they're like but you're right here and then all of a sudden they turn it and you see the third dimension and they realize that he's actually way down here and they're way up here whoa wow. but because it was when it was flat we thought they were like right here but then when we realized that there's depth suddenly and, and that's a really dramatic way to make that point yeah when it's happening in an action film yeah we, then you really see the big difference between two and three dimensions wow you know and and they make it clear with with, and, and I've seen other films that have used drone technology in a similar way. It's like points on a on a matrix that w that would that would articulate a shape. Yeah. You know, and and it, in two ways, like so somebody had like a like a, a an alternate reality that was mapped against um, all these little points of of drones that it was similar to the way that the birds will make a shape. Yes. You know, multiple yeah. hordes of birds right. making a shape. And, of it. and they would do and they would use some kind of like. Um, holographic technology. Mm -hmm. They did it in one of the Spider Mans recently. I, I saw it. I was like, wow, that's just wild. Yeah. But anyway, um, no, but it's really fun stuff. But my next, my next goal is to finally really realize the opera in a theater. And and how is that? Uh, how is that acclimated to the? Um, a, well, how is that compared to the the Art Matrix? This this opera. Well, it's a, it's, sim it's a lot. It's very similar. And uh, in the main focus of, of the opera when I first wrote it was a warning. It was a warning that the planet was on fire, and I knew it was on fire in 1988. You know, and now it's like, you know, I mean, now today I just heard on the news in Sydney if you go outside it's like smoking 32 cigarettes. Oh my gosh! <laughs> like, and they, and they were showing. I mean. I don't know if they're if it's a, I, mean, I know some people think it's fake news, but I'm watching like icebergs just fall into right. the water. No, no. I, ironically, um, last night it was we were talking to my son about uh, underground coal fires. Oh There's like a, currently they say that there is a hundred and um, 150 underground coal fires, either natural or man-made, and they can't snuff them out. They've tried putting semen in there, oh gosh, wow. and one city. Uh, had to be evacuated years ago oh 
but there's still like 12 people that will not move and it's just like heat on the ground spurring like uh, oh my what was that movie that movie Silent Hill style oh wow you know what I mean these fault lines just bubbling with heat oh coal files on the ground so when I think of the forest fires I go yeah a lot of man made and it's just horrible that people are it's like it's like natural disasters but you, you think how is that affecting the entire planet you know um so you were saying, sorry, I got I got you off tangent. You were saying about the uh, the the fires and it was like smoking in Sydney. Yeah, in, and that's the set of the news today on, on Channel Eleven. It's crazy. Was that going outside in, in Sydney right now? The air pollution is so bad that it's like smoking thirty two cigarettes. Jeez, a day. a day. Yeah, I'm like that's just, that's just wrong. Yeah, it's just wrong. It's crazy. Anyway, but my thing was, I mean, I had a really dramatic way of because I really wanted to make the point. Yeah. I had to. I, it was like an inkling that I had. And, and 80, 80, make, make the point of what? <laughs> that if we don't stop it, it's going to end. Mm. You know, so my, the, the, for me, the, the easiest way to make that point was to, use the, the, to do the Noguchi thing. And Noguchi has this really great way of looking at time, you know? So he'll look at time like going all the way back to like primordial stone. Yeah. And then all the way in the future into like rolling asteroids and, sa and satellites. Uh -huh. So he'll talk to you on his video like, this you, you could be, you, you this could be a film that you're watching as you're traveling through space, and he knows that this video that that you're watching now is a, is a dynamic thing, and it exists in time like anywhere you know yeah. he knows that he's left this artifact, and it could be any point in time that it's being accessed and and and, and, and you know and watched. Mm -hmm. So he has a really great way of looking at time, which makes it timeless, because he's thinking all the way back to the beginning and all the way into the future at the same time. Wow. So he has a great way of looking at time. And, the, I mean, and he just happens to be Japanese-American. Oh, you know, so that, that Japanese component that's like built into his childhood wow. really gives him power. Anyway, so I did the same thing with my opera. So my thing was to go back to the Big Bang. Yeah. The Big Bang is like the thing, you know, the big deal. And I'm, and I'm like, if, if we don't like slow down, we're going to end with another Big Bang. Right. Just, and, and it's scary because it's so similar. It's so like symmetrical at yeah. both ends. You know, and I'm like, how else can I make the point? I'm like, yeah. If, and so, I mean, they found hundreds of uh, thousands of uh, Earth-like planets, but they're right. nothing like our kind of life. Exactly. And they, they, golly, and we're probably very, very rare. Yeah, and lucky. We're so lucky. Yeah. And um, that's another thing that cybernetics does is that it points to an order in the universe. Huh. That there's a systemic order. I mean, we have like the sun rising and setting. Right. We have like the tides. We have all of these rhythms. Yeah. That that we can that we can observe. We need to get, there's Science. quantum reality. Yeah. There, there are other layers of reality that we can't even perceive. Right. Not to mention the dark matter. There are some things yeah. that we can perceive mm. that are measurable mathematically that point to some order. Order. Yeah. Even but it's really unfashionable. To right. Even ma even mathematically, the disturbance of not being able to calculate the missing data, which they say dark matter is. They're just like. We have a measurement, and we can't measure this or or figure out what this is, and yet that's that's another. That's another. That, that's another one of my favorite points to make. Also, is my father taught me this early on. I got really lucky. My father was a math teacher. Yeah. So early on, I love people think about this: is that when you go to a ruler, for example, and you go between two millimeters, you forget that between these two millimeters, is there a, there's an infinite number of fractions. Like infinity can go that small too. Yeah. It doesn't just get. But you always think of infinity as this like impossible huge thing, but it also gets really, really impossibly small. Too. Yeah. Nano. And it never stops. It can just keep getting us yeah. us infinite number of pieces of tiny, 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 tiny. tiny. You know, and it never and it can just never stop and just keep getting but split it again, but split it again. Mm. You know. So we don't think about that, and that's really exciting to me. Yes. Yes. My, me as well. And and uh, getting down to the strings. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it was good to have you on this podcast, well, thank man. You. It's good I testing, it. and uh, yeah. So I hope it works out. If we can edit it, and make something of it. Paul L. Yes, exactly. Paul uh, S. S. Nelson. Yes. And it's with uh, the Art Matrix, and and uh, look him up. And what was the paper called? And what was the website? Oh, the the paper's called um, the Cybernetic Art Matrix: The Story of the Grid. Uh huh. And you can read the you can read the paper. It's easy to get to at paulsnelson.com. Okay, cool. We'll put it in the link as well. Put yeah, it in the description. It's on my blog page. Very good, very good. Well, awesome. All right, I'm gonna pack it up then. I guess. <laughs> this is great. This is good. I can't wait to see what how it I comes hope it out. Perfect. Turns out okay. Me too.